Unbelievable. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Gualfi Baptist Church. Good to see you all here this morning. For uh, any visitors that are with us, if you guys can just look in the back of the uh, pews and check out that visitor card, we just want to know who you are. We can show you some love next week. So if y'all can fill that out for us and put it in the offering plate, that'd be great. I'll go ahead and open us in, uh, in a word of prayer this morning. Father, I just thank you, Lord. Today is a good day. It's a good day because we're here with you. I'm so excited. I'm so excited what the service has to offer for us, the worship that we get to do. Um, I just feel blessed. I feel blessed to be here in your house with my family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so when I think about September, the first Sunday, I think about how we actually have two new years every year. Right? We got the January 1st, we flip the calendar over all the New Year's resolutions, but we also have the first Sunday in September if you're a church-going person, at least here at Guelphming, right? And so it's our new church year. It's our very first Sunday of the year today. And so we have new ministries. We have new people on different things. We have new leaders. And so we have January 1st, but then there's today. And so I think about every time there's a new year, right? A lot of times it's the new new year, but not the new church year. But this week I was reflecting on the previous church year, and I think about the things that went well this past year. There's a lot of stuff that, that this church was very blessed with this past year. Right? I think about me personally this past year. And then I think about the things that I personally could have done better. Right? You know, just time of reflection. This past year, I don't know about you guys. For me, personally, I'm always a glass half full kind of guy. This year's been tough. It's been a tough church year. And I think the intentional interim process under normal conditions... It's designed to be a tough process, right? It's designed for us to look internally and look who we are as a church, things that could have done better, things that we need to do better, things that we need to change. But then we layer COVID on top of this intentional interim process for the past 18 months, and I think it's been exponentially more difficult than it would have been in normal times. You know, when we're deciding, do we close the church or do we open the church? When we decide, do we do communion or do we not do communion? When we decide, are we allowed to have Sunday school? What, how many people can be in here? How far apart do they need to be? It's just been hard. It's been really hard. And so, but then I think about today, you know, because today is the first Sunday of the month. And I, and I look right here in front of me and I think about what we have the opportunity to do today. We get to commune with the Lord. And then I slow down for a second and I think about what that actually means. And it just blows my mind how the Lord Jesus Christ wants to commune with me. Are you kidding me? It just blows my mind. I don't know about you guys. And hopefully you got your Bibles. And so if you can flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so Paul, in this letter to Corinth, you know, they were viewing communion as just like a ritual. It's just something we do, right? It's that time of the day, that time of the week, that time of the month. We go ahead and check it off the list and, and kind of move on with our day. And so Paul... We were talking about that this morning in, uh, in Sunday school. The whole church had Sunday school together, for those that couldn't make it this morning. And we were talking about how sometimes I view the Bible as suggestions. You know, if you feel like doing it, it's uh, go ahead and give it a shot, and not requirements. But the Lord tells us that if we're going to partake in communion, there are things that are required of us. And so look at chapter 11, verses 27 through 29. Therefore, pastor... <laughs> Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Oh my. Right, that, 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 hit, that cut me pretty deep this week. Um, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And so my Bible, I have one of these commentary type Bibles, probably a lot like you do. And so my commentary says to come to the table in an unworthy manner means to come in a spirit of disunity or division. Christians should first examine themselves, not to beat themselves up over personal sin, but to, ter to determine if they're holding something against a fellow believer that would cause disunity in the body. And so, you know, I'm going to kind of flip over and read one more thing. So flip over to 1 John with me. 
And so the Lord also tells us here how we're supposed to act towards each other. And so 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. All right, so, guys, a second. So, fellowship with him and one another is the titling in my Bible. It said, this is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So guys, I'm pretty fortunate this morning that I get this opportunity. Right? I, I get to stand up here, and I've already asked the Lord for forgiveness. But now I'm going to ask you guys. This year has been hard on me. And, and I burn at a 10 pretty much at all times. And there's been times that I've, I've been burning at a 12, and that's not good. And I've said things to you guys that I regret. I've acted towards you in certain ways at certain times that I apologize for. Because I, I truly regret it. You guys are my brothers and my sisters. And I spend more time with you than I do my own family. And that, that, that's the truth. I see y'all more than I see a lot of my family. And, and when we're working in unison, man, we should be interlocked. And, and we should be looking at the one thing that matters, and that's Jesus Christ himself. And that should be all that matters to us. And I, I've turned my eyes away at certain periods of time this year. And I'm so sorry. And I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. Because today when I take communion, as it says in 2 Corinthians 9.15, I want to take communion with a grateful heart. And that, that way I can say along with all the generations of Christians that have come before me, that, that I can give thanks to God for the indescribable and inexpressible gift that he's given us. Good morning, everyone. If you'll stand and we're going to worship and sing together.
for that. Good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you here today. We lost one of our uh, very special members this week as Bill Morrison passed away, as you know. Uh, I'm going to give you the schedule. If you need to write it down, get out a pencil or a pen for this week of how we're going to do things. Wednesday, September 8th, we're going to have visitation here at the church from 4 to 6 p.m. And uh, we'll do that so that uh, you can also come to prayer meeting where we are looking at the book of Acts. And I encourage you to come and be a part of that. Then on Thursday, September 9th, the family will have visitation at 11 a.m. in the morning on Thursday. And then at noon will be the service and then that service will be here at the church and uh, it'll be followed by lunch for everybody for everybody so we want you to come and fellowship then and then the graveside will be done later for the family so uh, just remember those times and if you forget give me a call and i'll try and remind you all right let's have a word of prayer Father, as Denny has shared this morning, so often we can come to church and go through the motions, even with the Lord's Supper, because we've done it so many times in our life that it loses sometimes its significance with us. But we're praying today as we are gathered here in, in your house and we are gathered with you because we are inviting you to join with us and be here with us. And we just pray that during this, uh, the rest of the time of this service, Father, help us to just open our minds and hearts and help our prayer this morning to be this to you. Lord God, speak to my heart today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, since I've been here, I've taught you over and over that God created each one of us. Because, first, because he loves us. He loves us. That's hard to grasp, as Diddy said. He loves us. And secondly, he loves us enough he wants to have fellowship with us. Not just on this earth, but forever he wants to have fellowship. Well, how do we have fellowship on earth with one another? Well, first of all, we have to talk. If you want to get to know somebody, you've got to talk with them in a common language that both of you understand. You can't get to know someone by just saying hi every once in a while. You have to spend time communicating. And we have to do the same thing with God. If we want to get to know God better, we must communicate with him daily. He wants that, especially since we are his children. Parents, you want to hear from your children, right? You want to hear from your grandchildren. But well, what do you want to hear about? Everything. Every little thing that's going on in their life. God is the same with us. He is our Heavenly Father. And He wants to hear everything that we have to say. And so, as his children, we need to fellowship with him and communicate with him. 
And he seeks that. It's a privilege. We te talk to God through prayer. It needs to be a part of our life every day. Now, Jesus was a prayer warrior. Jesus is our example. He had to be away from the Father from three and a half years. That had to be excruciating for the Father and the Holy Spirit and all the angels of heaven, along with the Father and Jesus, to be apart for that long just had to be horrible. So what did he do? Well, he continually talked to the Father through prayer. And the Bible tells us that he did it sometimes all night long. The disciples, after an exhausting day, would watch him while they had to just lay down and go to sleep. They were so tired. But he'd go off to the mountain and spend the night praying. But then they'd see him come back the next morning with this renewed vigor and this renewed strength. And it was no wonder they said to Jesus one day, can you teach us to pray? And what they were saying, could you teach us how to pray like you pray? Because we want that power and that vigor in our lives too. Prayer is the intimate communication between God and his child. Communication is a two-way street. If you start to talk with someone and you dominate the conversation, they're going to learn a lot about you, but you're not going to learn anything about them. The purpose of communication is for us to learn about each other. God wants to hear from us every day. He misses it when we don't pray. But he also has things he wants to say to us every day. And which of those two are the most important? What we have to say to him or what he might have to say to us in our lives? And so if we avail ourselves of prayer, it's one of the greatest privileges and we will be most blessed. It's the best way to begin a day, and it's the best way to end a day in prayer. And so here in what we're going to look at in John 17 this morning, Jesus is facing the cross. He's on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to pray a prayer. This is not in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he's going to pray a prayer. Well, how in the world does John know what Jesus prayed in a prayer where Jesus is alone and by himself? Well, like the rest of Scripture, is inspired. John was given this by the Holy Spirit so he could write down exactly what Jesus prayed. And what we notice about this prayer is he was praying this prayer in chapter 17 of John primarily for his disciples. And I believe when we look at the prayer, we realize he wants the same things for us that he wanted for them back then. So this also is a prayer for all of his children to come throughout the ages. In verse 1 of chapter 17, it, Jesus spoke these things and he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And he's going to say something that he has denied up to now. He says, Father, the hour has come. Over and over, things were happening. Jesus would say, well, the hour has not yet come, but now it's here. And notice what he asked for the Father. Glorify your Son. 
so that the Son may glorify you. G. Campbell Morgan says this, The deepest passion of the heart of Jesus was not the saving of men, even though he came saying, I am here to seek and to save the lost. His passion, deepest passion, was the glory of God. He came to earth to give glory to the Father. And then the saving of men, Morgan says, because that is for the glory of God. Even in saving men, his purpose through that was to bring glory to the Father. And isn't that what we should want to do in our lives? I want to know that my life is bringing glory to God. Don't you? Anybody? Don't you want to know that God finds glory in your life and in my life? That he is glorified in and through what we do every day. So verse 2, he says, even as you gave him authority, and he's going to speak in the third person for a little bit, even as you gave him, talking about himself, authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is one of those verses that the people who believe in election hold on to. Election is simply a belief that God already knows who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Some people he means to be saved. Some mean people he just means to be saw, uh, lost. If you're the elect, you're going to be saved. Even if you're a grumpy old person... And, and a horrible person, you're, if you're one of the elect, you're going to be saved no matter what you do. And if you are destined, predestined to be lost, it doesn't matter what you do. You can be the nicest person in the world. You're going to be lost in the end. That's election. And when it says here that to all whom you have given me, those are the ones that he has given eternal life. Do I believe in election? No. I believe that God said, whosoever comes. I believe the Bible says, for God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth in him. The predestination is not in whether or not you're saved or not. The predestines are the ones who have chosen to be saved. God predestined that every person that comes to Jesus and puts their faith and trust in him will be saved. That's what predestination is. And that is what election is. In Matthew 28, Jesus says this, all authority has been given to me and now I give it to you, his followers. And then he says, go. And so now after the day of Pentecost, now with the authority of Jesus upon them, they went and they made disciples just like he had told them to do. So, in verse 3, Jesus is going to give us a definition of salvation. And I would say, if it comes from Jesus, this has to be truth. Amen? Are you with me today? This is eternal life, he says. This is it. Jesus speaking. That, you, that they may know you the only true God, and that they may know me, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's as simple as you can get it. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Salvation is knowing you and knowing me. The word in verse 3 in the Greek for know is the word gnoso, gnosko. Tenney writes, however fully man lives in the world, he ultimately reaches the point where nothing is new because he has reached his human limits. Only the knowledge of God can give enduring satisfaction because God alone is eternal. Contact with God will provide the fullest experience and the experience of God's eternal being will be eternal life. When I was in college, I was in psychology, which is where I got my degree. I worked on the psych lab and we worked with labs, labs. We worked with rats. And so I spent a lot of time with rats. In fact, I had my own rat. I used to put him on a string and walk him down the hallway like a pet. And, uh, and what we would do is put little probes into the brain of the rats, into their hypothalamus, and they would shock it a little bit, and they'd see, now what does that make him do? Does he eat more? Does he sleep more? Does he get grouchy? To learn what the hypothalamus is all about. That's all we studied the whole time in that lab. My genius, genius of a professor said to me one day, you know, Bob, the more we learn about the brain, the more we realize what we don't know. Man can only go so far, and then they reach their limit. Only God is eternal. So he says in verse 4 and 5, I glorified you, Father, on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. You say, Bob, how do I glorify God on earth? Accomplish the work that God has given you to do. That's how you do it. He says, with the glory which I had with you, but even before the world was. Even before I came to earth, we had all this. I took that glory and I shared it with everybody in the way you had called me to do it. The hour, which he so frequently said had not yet come, had now arrived. And the humiliation of having to die a human life. How humiliating. But to the Lord, that was glorification. Because that's why he came. What we would consider the end of life, Jesus considered return to the reality of eternal life. Christian praying depends on Jesus' relationship to the Father. Through Jesus, we have access to the Father. We talk about he is our intercessor. I pray the Holy Spirit makes sense of it. Jesus takes it before the Father. And then Jesus promises over and over that the Father will respond back to us in prayer. So verse 6 and 7. I have manifested, I have shown, I have put a light on, I have made visible your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. I have done everything to manifest your name to them. They are yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything that you have given me is from you. So he says in verse 8, for the words which you gave me have given, I have given to them, and they received them, and they understood that I came from you, and they understand this. They understand that you sent me. 
They believe I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. Now, they didn't understand his death yet. <laughs> they weren't going to understand his resurrection. They had made a lot of, of uh, accomplished a lot in those three years spent with Jesus. But there was still so much that they just did not understand. I think about Paul. Paul spent three years with the Ephesians declaring God's truth. He followed Jesus' example. Same thing that these disciples are going to do. In Acts 20, Acts 20, verse 17. Jesus calls together his brothers from Ephesus. Why? He's going to Jerusalem. They don't want him to go. They know what's awaiting him. And they were right. He was going to be arrested. And he was. But he says to them, From Miletus, he sent Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and I even went house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of the repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know more than anybody that I have been faithful to you. That's why Paul later was able to say this. I have finished my course. I have finished what I was called to do. And that's what we all want to say when we get to heaven. I finished what God had for me to do while I was here on earth. And then he talks about, so because of that, there's this wonderful crown laid up for me to receive one day. Do you think that Paul one day will hear the words from Jesus, well done, I think so. Paul was able to say, no man's blood is on my hands. What? Never did I meet somebody I didn't tell them about Jesus. Mm. He says, I did not shrink from declaring unto you from house to house. So often, our type of evangelism is simply opening the church doors twice a week. And one day a week, we hope that lost people will come and just show up. The other day, most of us don't come. That's a plug for Wednesday night. But anyway, and so we just hope the problem is, lost people don't know they're supposed to go to church. And they don't know why they need to go to church. Because they don't know they're lost. And they don't know they need to be saved. Until somebody who loves them enough has the courage to tell them what Jesus did for them. Most people who get saved on a Sunday morning in church come forward on Sunday morning because a Christian led them to Jesus during that week. Who loved them to tell them what they needed to hear. There's a church in Jacksonville where the deacons, only job for, to be a deacon in that church is you have to be a personal soul winner. They don't have deacon meeting because deacons meeting is every Tuesday night they go out and knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. Every Sunday 
Every Sunday, they baptize between 35 and 75 people. Every week. And our tendency is to sit and wait. Please come. Please come. <gasps> There's a lost person out here. Come on over here. I had a youth minister in my last church. Didn't matter where he went, he was telling people about Jesus. I go outside and there were some young people who were chasing Pokemons. Some of you don't know what that is. And supposedly Pokemons were showing up at our church. So there was a whole group of them looking for Pokemons. Well, he just went out in the middle of them and started telling them about Jesus. They didn't get a Pokemon maybe, but they got Jesus. Paul didn't sit in a church pew. He did go to the synagogues and he preached every chance he got. But during the week, he was a tent maker. And as a tent maker, he day by day shared the gospel with people that he was working with. And he was a witness every chance he could. And then while he was in Ephesus, he rented out the school after school hours that he could use the stage that they had outside and for three years he preached from that stage Jesus as travelers were walking by and the Bible says this in those three years everybody in Asia Minor heard about Jesus because of that now today that's the country of Turkey Every person who traveled through and everybody came through heard about Jesus because Paul was out there every day preaching Jesus. Now, I've seen preachers preaching on a street corner. Any of you seen a preacher preaching on a street corner? And sometimes you want to say, oh, that's such a waste of time. Don't you believe it? We want people to come here. Jesus said to his disciples, go! And Jesus was always on the go. Did you notice that? I don't have any account in, in the Bible where Jesus said, oh, it's, it's church day today, let's go to church. He was always out in the world reaching people. And so everybody came to know Christ, or at least heard about Christ. We are seeing in Acts that Peter and John passed a man who had, was lame from his birth. All the Paralympics this week, it's been exciting to watch. They had to say to him, sorry, we don't have anything to give to you. We've got no money. Uh, but I tell you what we do have. And then Peter just grabbed him and said, walk, pulled him up. His legs, legs that had been atrophied for years, just skin and bones, all of a sudden had strength and he stood. And of course, because of that, they got thrown in jail. But that's the kind of testimony. Jesus didn't have anything to give in worldly goods to his disciples. He had no money to give them. He didn't have a new automobile to give them. But what he did give them is what God had given him to give them. So in verse 9, he says, I pray for them. I pray not for for the world. What? I pray for my followers, but I pray not for the world. I pray for them that thou hast given me, for they are thine. Jesus is our intercessor. Robert Murray writes this, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies, 
Distance is no matter. He is praying for me. What a loving prayer to pray for his followers. And guess what? He prays for me. That is enough. I'm privileged in my life to have known so many people in my family. To, I've had so many people pray for me in my life. For years, I would run into little old ladies that come up and say, never met them before. I pray for you every day. Do you know that Jesus loves you so much that he prays for you every day? Isn't that special? To know that he's praying for me. Well, this verse begs a question. Does God hear the prayer of a lost person? And the answer is, Jesus says, I pray not for the world, but for those which you've given me. The only prayer that God hears of a lost person is when they are confessing and repenting of their sin and asking Jesus to come in to their life as Savior and Lord. One of the things I've noticed when you witness every lost person you talk to, one of their excuses is they'll always say, well, I pray all the time, Bob. I pray all the time. And I don't say, well, good luck with that. <laughs> John 17, 10 and 11. All things that are mine are yours. Everything that is yours is mine. And I have been glorified in them. You've given all these things to me. What he's saying. I am no longer in the world and yet they themselves are going to have to be in the world I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So there are five truths here. Jesus said, I'm no longer in the world, number one. Number two, but my followers are going to still be in the world. Number three, he says, I'm coming to you, Father. Number four, so keep them in your name. And then the fifth thing, so that they can be one as we are one. If you say you are one, that's what First John's trying to say. If you say you are one with Jesus, but you aren't one with your brother, you are a liar. Ouch. So in verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except for the son of perdition, so that scripture might be fulfilled. In verse 13, now I'm coming to you. I thought you were going to be killed. Now I'm coming to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I'm coming to you, but I'm not leaving them alone, giving them the Holy Spirit. Why am I doing that? Because I want my children to have my joy. Jesus said to his disciples one day, I have come so that you might have my joy. God wants us to be joyful. Sometimes I look out on Sunday morning when we're singing and it doesn't look too joyful. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. I want to go, where's the joy? Christians ought to be the most joyful people in the world. We're going to heaven one day, forever. 
Bill's already there. We'll see him again. Hallelujah. Shouldn't we be joyful in our lives? While I was with them in the world, verse 12, I kept them in thy name. In verse 13, I've come that they might have my joy. Joy is that happiness that's above the circumstances of life that we live every day. Romans 5, 3 says, and not only this, Paul says, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, wherein we greatly rejoice, though now even for a season we're in heaviness through manifold temptations, so that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. And then Paul says in Romans 8, 18, 21, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility and and not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of God and of the children of God. If you are missing the true joy of your salvation, then something is missing in your life. Hear me, if you don't have the real joy of Christ booing you, building you every day, something is missing in your life. Bob, what do I do? I confess that is sin. Lord, you know, I remember the day that I got saved as a seven-year-old boy and I went to the front of the church and I was jumping up and down and I could not stop jumping up and down. And after the service, people came by to shake my hand and they had to do it this way. Bob, we're so glad that you're in our church now. What happened to that along the way? If you don't have the joy of your salvation, it's time you begin confessing that. Lord God, I don't know where it happened. I don't know when it happened. But I've lost my joy. And I need it back. Well, Jesus, here's what I'm asking you. I want you to show me what stole my joy. Show me what's going on in my heart that's stealing my joy. And help me to find my joy again in you. And when you do that prayer, you're giving the Holy Spirit permission to begin to reveal to you what it is that's holding back your joy. Because God doesn't want you to not know. He's, he saved us, Jesus said, so that you might have my joy in your life. Jesus, something is missing 
But maybe this morning during the invitation time when the deacons are here up front, maybe you'd come and take their hand and just say to them, will you pray for me that I can find my joy again? I've lost it along the way. I need it back. I need it back. Father, I just want to pray for this invitation time that you'll use it for your glory and your glory alone. Father, there are some here today that have lost the real, true joy. And it's because of sin in their life. They know that, but they don't know what exactly it is that took it away. I pray they'd have the courage to come and just say, will you pray for me that I can get my joy back? Forgive me, Jesus, for losing it. Help me, Jesus, to find it again. In Jesus' name, amen. As Mary comes, as our deacons come and the ladies come, I'm going to ask you to stand and you come as God is speaking to your heart this morning. I invite you to come. Let's stand. to come sit at the front who are serving. We decided today to uh, serve you. And so the deacons are going to do that. They're going to actually be bringing the bread and the cup down at the same time. So you'll take the bread and the cup and then we'll have a time of, of sharing that together. Remembering that this is a holy time. This is a time when we are remembering what Jesus did for us at Calvary. His willingness. In agony. Willing to go. Face what he faced, but most of all, to bear our sin. 
his broken body, his shed blood. Father, I pray today as we take the Lord's Supper, it would just not be another experience, but that you would bring it home today in our hearts and that we would remember what Jesus did for us. And as he said here over and over, his love, that you might be glorified by what we do today. Father, we want to bring glory to your name for all that you have done for us in all of our lives on earth and what you have in store for us for the rest of eternity. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And I just pray, Father, that today we might realize that and that might impact our hearts and our minds as we share this Lord's Supper time together in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in Luke that the day of unleavened bread came, which was the Passover, to be sacrificed. They would sacrifice an animal. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make ready for us the Passover, so that we may eat. They said to him, Well, where, where do you want us to make it ready? He said to them, Behold, when you are entered in the city, you'll meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Very easy to spot. Men didn't carry pitchers of water. Women did. A man would stick out like a sore thumb. So they found him quickly. Follow him into the house where into he goes. And you shall say unto the master of the house, The teacher has said unto thee, where is the great chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room. How large? Maybe as large as this room. We know at least 120 during Pentecost were in and around that room. He will show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found it just as he said unto them. And so they made ready the Passover meal. So they shared the Passover meal together. That means as the father of the group, he would have told the story of how Moses went into Exodus and God led the people out of the nation of Israel. Egypt and across the river and then eventually into the promised land. Jesus would have told that story to them as a part of their Passover meal. So when the hour was come, he sat down and the apostles now are only with him. He said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I'm not going to eat the Passover meal again until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he shared with them the Lord's Supper.
the deacons wanted to share this with you this morning to because they wanted you to know how much they love you and how much they love each other and that's a part of the lord's supper we need to love each other amen if you believe that put your hand up amen we are one in the body of christ amen It says first that Jesus took the bread when he had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup in like manner after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, even that which is poured out for you. Then he told his followers, every time you do this, you remember me and what I've done for you. And I believe every time we do that, it also binds us closer to one another. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege we have of sharing together the Lord's Supper this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus for being willing to go to the cross for me. And the willingness that you had to take all of our sin and bear it on the cross. So that as your blood was shed, your forgiveness fell over all of our sin. So that today, our sin has been washed away and we are white as snow. Thank you for that. Go with us this week and help us to take the opportunity to tell somebody what Jesus means to our life. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.